I invite you to open back up to Colossians. We're in chapter 2. <clears throat> Colossians chapter 2. You'll remember as Paul began this letter in the book of Colossians, and I think this is probably week, what, 13 maybe? The message 13 of our Colossians study. But as he began some 13 weeks ago, right, as we began looking at this letter, Paul was thanking God for the report that he had received in response to how the Colossians had received the gospel. And he was very grateful, he's very thankful. And he begins that letter just expressing that gratitude of thanks to God for the reception of the gospel message. He continued on by extolling Christ, the Son, as the Lord of creation, the Lord of redemption. We saw that in verses 15 through 23 of chapter 1. And now he unveils this, this agonizing concern that he has for the spiritual growth and maturity of the Christians there in Colossae and elsewhere. Remember, this was most likely a circular letter like the letter to the church in Ephesus. And so these letters would have been shared amongst congregations. And they would have all been together for the reading of that word. So much like Chuck always says, you know, we're so grateful that our kids are in here with us. We love to have families together hearing because the word of God is the power, right? That word is where the power is. It's not in programming. It's not in anything that we would do. It's not in high technology or, or light shows or any of those things. It's the word of God that changes us. And he is faithful that he, meaning God, who began a good work, what's he going to do? He's going to carry it on into completion. And we're very grateful for that. Amen? And so Paul is agonizing here for the maturity and the growth of these believers in Colossae. He wants not only to encourage them in their walk, which we're going to see today, but he wants to do so in light of the fact that there are wolves in sheep's clothing amongst them. And we talked about that some last week as we began to turn the corner into this chapter of the book of Colossians. We've talked about that other times as well. It's not something that we shy away from. There is truth and there is non-truth. Amen. There is the truth of God's word, and then there are deceptions that are close to the truth, many of them. Some of them not so much. Some of them are far, far from the truth. But many of them are very deceptive, and, and they look very close to the truth, and yet they are not truth. Remember, 1% arsenic in something that's 99% good is still 1% arsenic, and it's still not true edible amen we don't want to allow false doctrine even if 99 percent of the other doctrine is good we do not make room for false doctrine for false teaching and that's what paul's going to begin to dwell on here uh, after we get through these next two verses we'll begin to see in verse eight he's really going to begin to drive home and hammer directly against the false philosophies the false religions the false teachings of gnosticism the eastern mysticism all those things that were creeping into the church in Colossae already remember Epaphras had made his way to visit Paul in Rome in prison and it was telling him of his concern for the Colossians and for the heresy that had already come into this young church and folks it's no different and just because a church exists longer than a few months or a few years doesn't make it any safer from false teaching false teaching finds its way into all churches and sadly we're seeing the embracing of these false doctrines today in many of our churches it didn't start in the churches, though. It started in our seminaries. The seminaries became liberal, and now many of the churches are liberal as well. And so we must continue to stand and speak against liberal theology, false theology, false teaching, false doctrine, wherever we may see it. And there's a reason. It's not simply because we're commanded to do so. That would be reason enough, amen? They would. But the, I think the overriding reason for the command is the fact that false doctrine, false teaching corrupts the truth. It distorts the truth, and what's at stake is the very soul of a people, the very soul, and so we want to protect against false teaching, and that's where Paul's going, and so as he makes his way into this, he's going to warn them, and uh, in fact, in verse 4, he already began talking about the persuasive arguments here in chapter 2 of those false teachers that he, he doesn't name them in verses 1 through 5, but he's hinting towards them. He's going to begin calling them out directly here shortly uh, in verse 8 and following, the, at least the, the doctrines that were wrong. But Paul had, had already laid this foundation, and so now these two verses, verses 6 and verse 7, where it says, Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him, having been firmly rooted and now being built up in Him and established in your faith, just as you are instructed and overflowing with gratitude. 
Now, these two verses, I believe, are the key to the entire letter. He's going to now encourage them to walk in such a way that they would be worthy of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the face of opposition, in the face of persecution, even, we know all of these things are true. We continue to walk rooted firmly in Christ Jesus. Now, he had already prayed to this end earlier in chapter 1, verse 10, where he said, so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. To please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Now, isn't that our calling today still? To walk in such a way that we're pleasing the Lord in all aspects? Not just when we come to church on Sunday or Wednesday or, let's see, or Friday or Thursday or when, you know, all those different days we're trying to remember. It's not just when we come and gather here together, but we seek to please him when we're not here together. When we're alone in our car, alone in our room, when we're driving and, and uh, we, we're cut off in traffic, are we pleasing to the Lord in those moments? When someone comes into our store, our shop, and really begins to test us, are we pleasing to God in those moments? Ms. Sharia shared several encounters, and she has stood the test. I don't know how she did it. I, uh, I, I guess it's good that you don't carry a gun on your person. There may be one under the counter. We won't get into that, but I guess that's a good thing. But do we please the Lord God in our day-to-day -day living? Do I please Him at home? Do I please God in the way I treat my spouse, my wife, my children? Am I wrongly harsh at times? Those things we need to repent of, amen? Are we pleasing to the Lord at school, at work? Yes, even at school, I did say that, right? Are we pleasing to Him then? Are we pleasing to the Lord when we know more than our supervisors and our bosses? Are we still pleasing to the Lord when they tell us wrongly to do something? Are we pleasing the Lord in our walk? And that's what's at stake here. And so Paul begins now in these next two verses. There are six things in these two verses. There are six phrases. I want us just to stop, break down slowly. There's nothing uh, magical, mystical, or otherwise. There's nothing secret. There's nothing Gnostic, mysterious. It's just very plain six key phrases that describe what this walk is. And so uh, hopefully you uh, have a note sheet there you can follow along with. But let's look back at verse 6 and let's see these these six things here this morning detailing this walk Christians are to walk in faith notice what he says therefore as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord so walk in him now how had the Colossians received Christ they had received him the same way we receive Christ today by grace alone through faith alone and you remember the letter to the, to the Ephesus church, the Ephesian believers. It's written at the same time from the pr same prison cell. This, these, these letters written together in a time period in Paul's life. And he writes in more detail to the Ephesus church, to that congregation about their salvation by grace through faith in Christ. He adds a few more details, but it's the same faith. It's the same way that we are, we are all saved. The same way we receive Christ, we are to walk in him. Paul mentioned in Romans 1, 16, some of you may remember these verses, verses 16 and 17, where he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it's the power of God unto the salvation of all who believe, first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. And then notice verse 17, for in it, meaning in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, but the righteous shall live by faith. The righteous man shall live by faith. He's quoting Old Testament prophet uh, Habakkuk here. And we know it's used elsewhere in, in uh, Galatians and, and in Hebrews also. This gets, gets touched on. But how do we live the Christian life? By faith. We, we live it the same way we receive salvation. By faith. Now what the Gnostic teachers were doing and, and what they still do today. They just don't necessarily call themselves Gnostics. Some of them are part of um, the so-called church. The so-called Christian church. Some of them belong to new apostolic reformation congregations, hyper-charismatic congregations. But, as we were discussing this morning, some of them belong to some ultra-reformed, or we might say again, hyper-reformed, hyper-Calvinistic uh, sort of uh, congregations as well. And the end goal is the same. It's to bring in something more than the Scripture and lead us somewhere that the Scriptures don't lead us. And all false teaching leads us in a direction that is away from the truth of Scripture. It does. And you have that on both extremes of the spectrum here in, in, in Christianity. Ultra-conservative, ultra-charismatic, and if you look very closely at the end game, a lot of it winds up being the same. We're seeking to build a kingdom to give Jesus rather than receive the kingdom that comes with Jesus. Amen? 
we don't build the kingdom in that regard. We are making disciples. We're making disciples. But the kingdom comes with the king. The kingdom comes with the king. And we need to remember that. The Gnostic teachers wanted to teach them some new truths. New truths for Christian maturity. They were the, the kind of esoteric secret knowledge types, much like Freemasonry still is today. Freemasonry rooted in Gnosticism. It is not Christian rooted in Gnosticism. But they wanted new truths and, and secret knowledge, and you had to be initiated. You had to make it to a certain level. All of these different types of structures put into place. But Paul says you started with Christ. It's very simple. Continue with Christ. You're not looking for anything more. And I know I've shared this before, but back during the days of Super Summer, when we would, the motto used to be, send us your best and we'll send them back better. So the, the motto used to be, send us your best students, we'll send them back better. And, and early on, I think that was pretty much the goal. I'm not sure what happened and what it morphed into now, but it's just not the same. But I remember even way back when Super Summer used to be a good endeavor for maturing disciples who were, who were teenagers, all right? Yes, that's possible. We see it happening even here. Uh, so yes, it's possible. But, but I remember there was an artist that was brought in, a worship leader brought in out of the San Antonio region, and he sang a song that was very catchy, very catchy. It was called There Must Be More. And we even brought it back for a short period of time to our church and began to teach to our students. And it was some time later that I actually began to listen to the words of the song that we were singing. There must be more. And it was basically, Lord, I'm groaning. Lord, I'm weak. I'm crying out. There must be more. There must be more. And it dawned on me one day that this song is horrific in its theology. What do you mean there's more? Christ is sufficient or he's not. And the Bible teaches us that he is sufficient. So how can there be more than Christ Jesus our Lord? Amen? We have to be very careful in that aspect then. But so we're to walk in faith. He says you started in faith with Christ. Now you continue with your faith in Christ. This is the only way we make spiritual progress. But notice the title that's given to Jesus. It says Christ Jesus the Lord. You might be surprised to know, but this is the only place where that, that sequence of uh, titles for Jesus is given. Christ Jesus the Lord. It's not used that way anywhere else in the New Testament scriptures. And so we see that here and only here in the New Testament, although there's historical evidence that the early church used this phrase often. We found it in catacombs written uh, underground. We, we found it on parchment, Christ Jesus the Lord, Christ Jesus the Lord. The Romans even used it to um, speak in a derogatory fashion against the Christians. They, they worshipped a man on a stick and they even gave him a donkey head on the cross and uh, making fun of somebody for worshiping Christ Jesus the Lord. It was in a sarcastic manner that they would draw these, the Romans would draw these things and write these things. But the church recognized this as, as maybe an early creedal formula that Christ Jesus is the Lord. And the reality is that Christ Jesus is the Lord. And I know there's a lot of debate and confusion about lordship salvation today, what it is, what it's not, and, and you shouldn't be lordship, you're adding works to Christ, and that's just false, that's faulty. Jesus is Lord already. We don't make Jesus Lord, amen? He is Lord. Now we submit at a point in time when he calls us, and he calls us before time, before the foundation of the world, but in time we respond, amen? And so we recognize his lordship, but we don't make him Lord. He is Lord. He is sovereign. No one else competes. No one. You and I try, and we fall short. We fail miserably. But he is the Lord. And so this Christ Jesus the Lord, I think, Paul, and he only hits on it right here, but he's speaking out against the esoteric, Gnostic sort of more ideology that was permeating this region during this time. This mystical experience, there has to be something more. You mean there's more to, to, to Christianity than just coming and studying and serving one another and, and honoring Christ and living in a worthy manner? There's more than this? I need to feel a certain way. We've been taught to believe that, haven't we? I have to experience. If, if I don't weep during the worship service, there's something wrong, according to certain theologies. But folks, that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible says that our foundation is rooted in Christ and it's rooted in truth, objective truth, amen? Our feelings are irrelevant. They are irrelevant. Our feelings come and our feelings go. Our feelings are deceiving. 
And what is our warrant? It's in the Word of God. It's in the Word of God, as Martin Luther said. The Word is that steadfast thing. Now, obviously, God can use our emotions, and He does, in fact, use them, I believe. But don't let feelings be the judge by which you base truth or falsehood. I get real excited and emotional about all kinds of things that aren't necessarily good things, aren't necessarily the best things, aren't necessarily truthful things. I mean, there's a time during some of the bad segments of my, my, my Lyme stuff here, there, there's times when I'm more emotional just because of the treatments that I'm, I'm, I have. And some of you can relate to that with different things that you, you're going through. You're, different, different medicines might make you more emotional. I mean, I can, I can watch a commercial on TV some days and get weepy. What is that? That's crazy. That's not manly, and I just admitted that in public. Oh, my goodness. But we're family here. It's okay, right? Please don't go tweet that. It's nobody else's business. You can make fun of me later. That's fine. You can make fun of me now. It really doesn't matter. But our feelings are not the judge of all things. Our feelings are deceptive. Truth is what we base ourselves on. And so we're to walk in faith. Walk in faith. And we're going to come back to that in a moment. This whole aspect speaks of walking faithfully in Christ. And so Christ is the Lord. And so we're walking in that acknowledgement. So secondly, it brings us to that very idea. We're to walk in Christ. To walk in Christ Jesus the Lord. And that's the main command here. In fact, in these verses, in the verses that follow, this is the command to walk in Christ. It's an imperative in, in the language it was given to us, in that Greek language. So this is the focus. This is the command to walk in Christ. All of these other things describe how we do that, how we walk in Christ. And it's just like this saying that goes, as a, fi uh, as a fish swims in the water, and then there's other things that get added there, but for us, as a fish swims in the water, so we walk in Christ. We walk in Christ. A fish out of water is outside of his or her fish, male or female. I don't know. Are they gender neutral? Maybe they're politically correct today and we just don't realize it. But a fish out of water, that was a bad joke. That was a bad, bad joke. A fish out of water is in the wrong environment and not designed to thrive and succeed and be even able to breathe properly, right? So a Christian outside of Christ is, is not going to work. We're not designed to be outside of Christ. We don't get saved just as hell insurance, and then we go on with our lives, with ourself being in the center, in control, right? Like uh, Jesus is my co-pilot kind of teaching today. And that's much of Christendom today. We just add Jesus to our already full lives, and that's not Christianity. We're to walk in Christ. The reality is that Jesus is our habitat. He is our spiritual environment, amen? Jesus is the one through whom we're able to do anything, and apart from him, we can do nothing. We can do nothing. It's through Christ. It's not through sensationalism, emotionalism. It's not manipulative. It's dependent upon Christ Jesus the Lord, or as Paul says here in Colossians, Christ in us, the hope of glory. Christ in us. So we walk in Christ. Not only is he in us, you remember when we started, right? Christ in us, the hope of glory, but now we're in Christ. We're surrounded by Christ. He is our spiritual environment, our spiritual habitat. That's why John says in John 15, 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. This is Jesus speaking here in the Gospel of John. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do some things, a few things. You can do nothing, he says. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Christ is our life. And so the word walk here speaks to that very aspect. In fact, it's used often in the Christian life this way. It speaks of action. It speaks of progress. It's never intending to be the ideal of us just walking in place. I never understood that. All right, we're going to walk in place in PE. Why? Let's walk around the gym. Let's do something. Maybe that's just my spastic nature, but I didn't like walking in place. It seems counterproductive. It seems wrong, and it is spiritually wrong. We don't stay in the same place. We move forward. We're hopefully in Christ we move forward, but we're moving. We're either going forward or going backwards. We're never standing still. The spiritual walk of believers is used throughout the New Testament this way. Romans 6, 4 talks about walking in newness of life. Romans 8, 4 says that we are not to walk according to the flesh. 2 Corinthians 5, 7, we're to walk by faith and not by sight. Galatians 5, 16, we walk by the Spirit. Ephesians, I think Paul uses this ideal of walking seven, 
seven times in the book of Ephesians alone. But in 5.2, he says, walk in love. Ephesians 5.8, walk as children of the light. Ephesians 5.15, be careful how you walk. Colossians, again, we saw walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. And then he also speaks of it in 1 Thessalonians 4.1, that we're to walk and please God. It's our life, our Christian life. So the question is, are we faithfully walking in Christ? Am I faithfully walking in Christ in such a way that I bring glory and honor to Him? Third thing we see here, the next phrase, having been firmly rooted. We see that. That's the next phrase. So Christians are to be rooted in Christ Jesus. Again, this is a very straightforward passage. Now at conversion, believers, right, actually put their roots deep down into Christ. We put our roots deep, deep down into Christ. Now, not too long ago, um, cut down some of the hedges out in front of our home that were uh, overgrown and the middle was dying. I think they had been there since the house was built or at least shortly thereafter. So um, my family bought that house in 1972, if memory serves, and uh, Becky and I and the girls are, are living there now. We bought it and remodeled it in 2017. You know, just like six weeks before Harvey destroyed the whole thing, and we rebuilt it again, and then flooded in Imelda, and now our insurance is like through the roof. Anyway, that's a whole other issue I'll pray about some more later. But um, uh, we took those hedges out. Sydney came over and did the stump grinding thing for us, and, and we got those things out. Now, before they came out, uh, Bobby Dartes had come over and was going to remove the poison ivy for us from under. It had grown all up in this, in this uh, hedge. And he thought he wasn't allergic to poison ivy. And maybe he's not because what we found out was that this was poison oak that was growing in this hedge. And what Becky found out a couple of weeks ago was that the poison oak, the top of the plant had been taken out of action, but the roots were still under the ground. And so in our yard, as she was pulling some other things out of the front yard, uh, she got into the poison oak because those roots had gone down deep into the ground. And what happens when something's firmly rooted, it eventually puts off more fruit. And so the poison oak is back with a vengeance. I mean, it's like it's got Becky's name and uh, knows where she lives, right? All of those things. And it found her in a very powerful way and, 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 and really messed her up pretty good. But in a positive way, Christians, we need deep roots. We need deep roots. I remember back during Rita, we were living on Memorial Drive in Orange at the time, and we had this one ginormous pine tree right in the corner of our yard. And the way the wind came through, it, it did snap off the top of that, but it also seemed to have pulled up before it snapped it. It pulled that pine right up out of the ground. And I had never seen a pine tree's root system. Have you ever seen one? It doesn't spread out like an oak. We had two big oaks back there that were unharmed. I believe because of their great root system. But that pine tree was pulled straight up out of the ground, snapped in half, and laid over our fence in the backyard and laid over the gully. And when we got back, and after we got power back and started going around cutting, we were cutting, uh, JB and I were cutting trees for days and days and days all around this area. But when we started examining that pine tree, I realized that root was about... It was a straight root. If you've ever, never seen a pine tree, the root went straight down. It was about seven and a half feet long, if memory serves. It was nearly eight feet deep into the ground, straight down, that root system was. It didn't work real well in preventing it from being uprooted by a hurricane. But the deep root aspect is something we need to consider. We need deep roots, but they need to spread out. We need to spread out our roots in Christ. Not in Gnosticism, not in new things, new teachings, but spread out in the things of God, the things in His Word. We need to be well-read, well-studied, well-prayed. We need to fellowship with other believers who are like-minded. We need to be firmly rooted in the truths of God's Word. Rooted in Christ. Now notice something here, having been firmly rooted. The idea speaks of, of something that is an action done to us. It's what's known as a passive voice. So we're firmly rooted, but we don't do it. We're firmly rooted because God does it. So God gets all the glory. Not only does he save us, but he gets the glory in our sanctification as well. That way we don't share credit with him. Now does that mean that we don't have to do anything? No, that's not what I'm saying. But here, Paul is speaking of the fact that God initiates the, even the maturing in us. 
It's passive. And so he places us into Christ. He does this through the baptism of the Holy Spirit, in fact, when he saves us. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says, For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, for we were all made to drink of one Spirit. Paul goes on to speak to this in Romans 8, 9. Romans chapter 8, verse 9, where he says, However, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. There is no Christian that doesn't have God's sealing Holy Spirit. <laughs> Amen? Filling and sealing. Filling, sealing, empowering, all those things, that's what God does for us. But again, God does it. And we're rooted in Christ and we're sealed by His Spirit. Fourthly, Christians are to be built up in Christ. So as our roots go down deep, and hopefully as our roots spread out deeply across God's Word, how many of you have a favorite subject of theology that you like to study? Anybody? I don't know if some of you do. Okay, there's their hands. I didn't see any movement over here. I'm like, these guys right here, I know these. <laughs> but many of us have certain areas that we like to study more than others. My favorites are soteriology and eschatology. I love studying those two things. Soteriology is the study of salvation, how God saves us. Eschatology is the study of the end things, the end times. I, I think that is a fascinating topic. But if that's all that I studied, if all I studied was eschatology, I would not be firmly rooted in the whole of Christendom, Right? I would, be, I would be myopic in my view of things. Eschatology affects other doctrines. They're all connected. They are all interconnected. So we need to look at all of the teachings of Scripture, all of the doctrines, and see how they fit together. Amen? And so we're to be built up in Christ, and that's what this pertains to. And so again, at conversion, all believing sinners. Now hear, hear me. We're sinners, right? We're born in sin. There's none righteous, not one. But there's a moment when God grants us to repent, and we do. John chapter 1, verses 12 and 13 speak to that. We're born of God. And so in that moment, that moment of conversion, believing sinners are built upon the foundation of Christ. And it's the same foundation that was laid by the apostles in the first century. We have the epistles written and uh, here speaking of that foundation. But it's Christ and his apostles. There is no true Christian that's built upon any other foundation. We're not built on tradition. We're not. We're not built on anything but Christ and the teachings of the apostles. That's what Paul said in Ephesians 2.20. He says, Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. Christ Jesus himself is the cornerstone of the foundation. And we're built up in him. Built up in him. And so here, Jesus the Lord <clears throat> is suggested as that foundation, and we are being built upon him. Rock after rock, brick after brick, we are being built into a spiritual building, a spiritual house. He uses different analogies here. The tree analogy with our root system, a, a building analogy here with us being built up ideal in Christ. And we just brick after brick as we're growing, as we're maturing in Christ. Another brick, another brick, another brick in that building. Another brick in that building. That's not a song from Pink Floyd either for some of you back in the day, right? Another brick upon brick being built. And we're being built up in Him. We were rooted once and for all, but we're being built up moment by moment by moment. We're rooted once and for all in Christ. That's why our security, the security of our salvation is found not in what we do. It's found in Christ Jesus, Amen. He holds us. He sustains us. He seals us with His Holy Spirit to guarantee that. But we're being built, transformed, moment by moment, from faith to faith, from glory to glory, as we grow in Christ, maturing in Christ. And folks, listen. If we're not maturing in Christ, there's a problem. And it's not a problem with Christ. It's not a problem with His system of maturing. The problem is with us. We're distracted or we're just denying the process. So let's examine ourselves today, Christians. Amen? Am I being built up in Christ? Do I love Christ more today than I did last month? Am I learning new things today that I didn't know two months ago? Am I growing? Am I maturing? Are my actions changing? Is my attitude changing? And let's even say it. Is my vocabulary changing? Not that you have to speak in like King James English or anything, but are, are your words cleaner than they used to be? Right? I mean, obviously, when we first get saved, if we had a, may I say, a potty mouth for 20 or 30 years, that doesn't necessarily 
you don't relearn that overnight. But there should be a progression in what we say, what we do, where we go, how we interact with one another. There should be visible fruit on the vine of our lives. Amen? So let's examine ourselves in that and let's seek to be built up in Christ. The fifth thing he goes on to say, having been firmly rooted and now being built up in him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude. So Christians are to be established in the faith. It's not enough, again, that we just get our hell insurance, right, quote unquote, as some people just kind of throw it out there, mass evangelistic calls, no discipleship, never any follow-up, never any accountability, and hardly ever any life change from those kind of experiences, but we're to be established, having been firmly rooted, now being built up and established in the faith. So brick after brick after brick, but that's not enough. It's not enough just to put more bricks on the wall. They have to be secured to the brick below them. That brick must be secured to the foundation. I have to be secured to the bricks next to me. There must be this interwoven kind of reality in the life of the church. We're all anchored together, cemented together, um, firmly held together, forming a faith together. But notice he says, in the faith. Established in the faith here, in your faith. What, what, what is this faith? That it means. Does it mean just our, our feelings, our, our belief? The faith as it's used by, by, by Paul here, I believe it's the same way that it's used by Jude in Jude chapter 1 verse 3, where he's contending earnestly for the faith that's once and for all handed down to the saints. We need to understand that the faith speaks of not just my subjective feelings or ideals or experience, but the faith speaks of doctrine. It speaks of truth. It speaks of what Christ Christianity really is, biblically speaking. Not necessarily what we've all made it out to be, but what it truly is, established in that faith. And so, so Christians, listen, please, please know this. And I know we say this often, but please, please let me say it at least once more today. We'll never obtain stability like this established faith. We'll never get there by our own inner feelings, our subjective experiences, not even through our private faith at home. We were made for one anothering. We were made to be part of the body. Again, brick after brick. You don't build a structure with one brick. I mean, that's just absurd. That's absurd. Now you have to be careful what Lego bricks you buy, in case you haven't been watching the news. They're pandering to all sorts of things today. But we have to be established, and it means that we do this together. Have him, and, and notice that last phrase there of, of, of this section. Just as you are instructed and overflowing with gratitude. So how are you and I each established in faith? Just as we were instructed. There's a togetherness that's in view here. Do you see it? It's not just what I learn in private all by myself, and I never test it against God's word or against uh, other believers. In fact, something else we say often is, if it's new, then it's probably what? It's probably not true. Our faith is an old faith. It goes back. Now, we may discover a new truth that we didn't know before, but it's not a new truth. It's new to us, perhaps, but it's not a new truth. These new truths are most likely not biblical. That's why the canon of Scripture is closed. There is no more new truth as far as doctrine is concerned. Amen? We don't need that. And my challenge to those who are continuationists who believe that there's still continuing revelation, even if it's imperfect, as Grudem and others um, believe, even if it's very, very much imperfect, as I believe, but e even if that's true, the foundation is still the Word of God. And my challenge is, until we know every bit of this Bible frontwards and backwards, I don't have room for new teachings. I need, I need to master this first, amen? This is our foundation, the Word of God. This is our foundation. So having been established as you were instructed. Now, we know in chapter 1, verse 7, that Epaphras was the one who, uh, it would seem most likely, started the church there in Colossae. He would have been the one instructing them. Having uh, come out of the church in Ephesus, um, he, he goes, he plants this church, and he begins to teach. Now, we know false teaching had come in, and so he goes to Paul asking for help, and, and, and that's going on. But as he came in to begin teaching right? As Epaphras had, had, had come in there, he um, then taught them in the faith, and for him to teach someone in the faith, guess what he had to do first and foremost? He had to know that faith himself, right? 
Now, oftentimes we get zealous, we get excited when we come to Christ, and sometimes we'll put people teaching before they're actually ready, and that's, that's our fault as the pastors and elders of churches that, that do that. But uh, we have to be very careful and make sure people are actually growing and knowing God and growing in their walk and being mentored and discipled, make sure they're maturing in their faith and that they have a grasp, at least on the basics, before we turn them loose to begin teaching others. But there's a pattern here. Epaphras had heard it from Paul and, and others in Ephesus. He goes, he plants this church, he's passing it on to those in the congregation, and that is still the way we do it today. We don't learn solely on our own. Yes, we should study Absolutely. I'm not saying don't ever study on your own. If you're only being fed by me on Sunday mornings, you're going to be anemic. You should study on your own and be fed here by the elders of the church and other believers as well. We're growing together. Amen? We're growing together. Um, 2 Timothy 2.2, Paul says, The things which you have heard from me, talking to young Timothy, who was leading a congregation, Timothy, the stuff you heard from me, what you saw in me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these things to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. What's he talking about? Duplicating himself in ministry. That's what we're doing. That's what we're called to do. The elders teach, the congregants learn, then the congregants teach others, right? It continues on. We're sharing Christ. We're sharing what we're learning. Hey, I just read Romans 6 this week, and, and, and I learned this, 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 and that. Have you ever noticed that? Or I read, uh, I read Romans 6 this week, and I don't understand it at all. I've got this question, that question, and this question. Can you help me? I mean, we're doing that. Iron sharpens iron. Amen? That's what we're called to do. And so we're being established in the faith. Paul also in Titus 1, verses 7, 8, and 9, he says, that the overseer must be above reproach. The overseer, shepherd, pastor, elder, you can use it. Those words are used interchangeably in different epistles. But the overseer must be above reproach as God's steward, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not addicted to wine, not pugnacious, not fond of sordid gain, but hospitable, loving what is good, sensible, just, devout, self-controlled. And notice this, holding fast the faithful word, which is in accordance with the teaching so that he will be able both to exhort in sound doctrine and to refute those who contradict. Do you understand what, what's in view here? You were taught something, now you need to share it with others to teach them to grow and to warn them against false teachings. Both of those things are in view here. But we learn, I've learned, and I share as I'm learning with you. I'm not exempt from this. No teacher, no pastor, no elder is. We are all in this together, growing, wanting to be deeply rooted. And then finally... As we're doing this, as we're walking in faith, walking in Christ, being firmly rooted, being built up, all of these things, as we're established in the faith, we're also to be thankful in our walk. We're to be thankful. And this is very important, and I don't think it's here by accident. I don't think it just rounds out the verse, you know, in a, in a way like Paul says, yeah, that sounds good. Let's just end it this way. I think this is critical because when we're not thankful for what we're learning as we grow, we become something else. You know what that word is? It starts with a P. Prideful. That's right. If we are not careful to be very thankful what, for what God is doing, we will very quickly fall into the sin of pride. It happens to the best of us, but we are to be thankful people. In fact, you think about it, Christians have every reason to be more thankful than anybody else on the planet. Do we not? I mean, think about this for a moment. While you were you, Christ saved you. While I was me, Christ saved me. Let me point the finger back at me. While I was lost in sin... Christ set his affection on me. While I was yet still a sinner, Christ died for me. And we have every reason to be grateful, to be thankful, do we not? He loved us in spite of who we were, not just because of who we are, as a lot of the New Age teachers teach us today. I've got to love myself, and, and if I love myself, God will love me, or, or the Spirit will love me, or the world will love me, or, or other people will love me. I've got to first love myself. That's new age, that's just, it's just not scriptural. We, need not, we don't need to think more of ourselves. That's not our problem. We, we think plenty about ourselves, amen? We need to think less of ourselves and think more of Christ. I must decrease so that Christ can increase. That was John's statement there in John chapter 3, verse 30. That needs to be ours as well. I must decrease so that he would increase. And so, are we thankful? Let's look at these verses again, verses 6 and 7. Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, through faith, right, by grace alone, through faith alone, so walk in Him. There's the command. Walk in Christ this way, in faith, in Christ, firmly rooted, 
being built up in him, established in your faith, just as you were instructed. So we're learning one from another and now overflowing with gratitude. We are to abound in thanksgiving. We are to abound in gratitude. And folks, listen, I know life is hard. I do, I get it. It's hard for us as well at times. I know we have, we have the loss of loved ones in our family, right? We have health issues ourselves, our people in our family, our, our congregants, and we hurt one for another. There's a lot of hard realities that we face because sin has come into this world. Sin has tainted everything that God had said was good. That's why Romans tells us that creation itself is groaning and travail like childbirth, wanting to be redeemed, wanting to be restored. And one day it will be. The creation itself will be made new. But until that day, we live in this fallen world. We live in this fallen world. We have to learn to be grateful for the blessings that God gives our way. And just in case we've forgotten, He saved us while we were really unsavable, right? Not worthy to be saved. He saved us anyway. He maintains our salvation in spite of us even today. And that's enough right there. But think about the fact that you woke up today. And these are easy things that we just take for granted. You woke up today. Not only did you wake up, you began breathing. Hopefully you were breathing through the night too. But, <laughs> but you were breathing for sure when you woke up or else you wouldn't have woken up. Okay, so follow my analogy here with me. But you're breathing. That's an involuntary reflex most of the time. Now, sometimes under labor, we help it out a little bit, right? But God gives us our very breath. The blood flows through our veins in such a way that it gives life. It's not too fast, too powerful. It's not too slow. Most of the time, it works perfectly well. When it doesn't work well, that's a result of the fall and a result of sin, sickness, all those things, disease. But it works like it's designed to. God created this environment for us. And I don't mean this building per se, but even this, the fact that we have a place to freely come that has air conditioning. That's a gift from God. We should be grateful for that because it's getting hot already. And if you're new back to the area, it's very muggy here. Okay, It's very muggy here. Thank God for the mugginess. Surely it does something good. I don't know what it is yet, but surely there's a benefit from it. We're still looking for that. Uh, I, I don't know what it is. Keeps your skin moist? I don't know. It, ugh, but there's got to be a good thing because, you know, it's here. We've got to find a reason to thank God for it. But seriously, folks, we should, be, we should be the most grateful people that there are on this planet. We should be so thankful for what God has done. And so, so instruction in biblical doctrine should produce inner joy and gratitude in us. And if it's not, folks, please do a, do a gut check. Please check yourself. Has pride creeped in as you seek to learn more and more and more? And, and, and are, are you just looking to win an argument, to win a debate? You just want to have more knowledge even. That's not necessarily bad, but the goal is not more knowledge. The goal is Christ, the glory of Christ. I want to learn more so I can know Him better. I want to learn more so I can share with others so they can know Him better. Christ is the end goal. I pray that's true of us. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for this day. Father, you've given us, we recognize that this day itself is a gift. May we, may we not spurn this gift. May we not spurn the love that you've given us. May we walk in a way that's worthy. Walk worthily of you, O God. Bringing glory to you, O God. May we decrease, as John the Baptist said. May Christ increase. May that be our goal. And may we seek to continue doing what we've what we've seen earlier, that we may proclaim Christ and, and admonish every person, teaching every man with, with, with all wisdom, so that we may present every man complete in Christ, as chapter 1 talks about in Colossians. That's our goal. May it not be just our finances. May it not just be our, our promotion at work. May it be more than accolades from a sports team as we, as we watch our children playing now and encourage them to interact. May, may it not be those things, but may Christ be our end goal. Those other things, may they be utilized in our lives to point people to Christ, to bring glory to Christ. May I work in such a way that Christ is glorified in me. May I play in such a way that Christ is glorified in me. May the words of my mouth, the attitudes, the affections of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O oh God. 
We pray this in Christ Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. Now, obviously, this message was for us, the church. Amen. But if you are here today and you do not know Christ Jesus in this way, please grab one of us after church today, after the service is over, and let's talk about Jesus. There is no salvation in anyone else. There's no other name given under heaven whereby we can be saved. It's only through Jesus Christ, and we would love to share that with you more today. There are other, other things to announce.